Problem 2 from the homework wants us to look at the graph of the derivative, which is called w of x in the homework, and try to understand what the graph of the function looks like, f of x, which is the antiderivative of this graph, based on uh, the information that we see. Uh, we're also told that f of 1 equals 0, and so we'll use that piece of information as well. All right, so what can we do? Well, we can decide the first things about monotonicity. Monotonicity has to do with where a function is increasing or decreasing. So we look at the derivative. And for us, the derivative is the function w of x. And so we just need to know where is that function positive and where is it negative. So it changes sign at 0, at 2, at 6, and at 8. And by looking at whether the graph we see is above or below the axis, we see it's positive, negative, positive, negative, positive. So our function is going to be increasing on the intervals negative infinity to 0, also on the interval 2 to 6, and finally on the interval 8 to infinity. Meanwhile, the function is decreasing on the interval 0 to 2, and on the interval 6 to 8. And that was just by looking at the graph being above or below the axis. The next piece of information we can find has to do with concavity, which has to do with the second derivative. So the second derivative of our unknown function f of x happens to be the first derivative of the function we see. And so this is going to be the slope of the picture up above. So we see that the slope changes at 1, it changes at 4, and it changes at 7. Now, the slope is actually not defined, so it doesn't exist at those three points. But to the left of 1, it's a negative slope. Between 1 and 4, it's a positive slope. Between 4 and 7, it's a negative slope. And after 7, it's a positive slope. And so we're able to determine where the function is concave up and concave down by looking at the sign. So, for example, here we see that the second derivative is negative, so my function is going to be concave down on the interval negative infinity to 1. Now using these sign analyses, we can also determine things like the max and the mins. So for example, I have a max every time the function goes from increasing and then followed by decreasing. And so here at 0, to the left I'm increasing, to the right I'm decreasing. So my function will go up and then down. So I'll have a maximum at x equals 0. I have another maximum here at 6. And I have a minimum whenever I go from decreasing to increasing. So that I go down and then up. So I have a minimum at 2 and another minimum at 8. So let's summarize that. We have minima at 2 and at 8. Inflection points come from where the concavity changes. So from being concave down to concave up, I'll have an inflection point at 1. Similarly, I'll have an inflection point at 4 and at 7. So let's summarize that. We have inflection points. At x equals 1, 4, and 7. So we can summarize these pieces of information graphically by thinking about uh, each of the intervals. So all of the points that something interesting happened, I've marked down on this number line. And so, for example, between uh, or to the left of 0, I am 
increasing and concave down and so I will look like that. Between 0 and 1 I am decreasing and concave down. At 1 my concavity switches so I'm now I'm decreasing and concave up and so as I go through the intervals I can sketch what all of the pieces look like. And if I were to join all those curves together, that would be essentially the graph of my function f of x. Now the only thing I don't know yet are the heights. And so this is why this is an application of integration. Because f of x is an antiderivative, it must be equal to the fundamental theorem of calculus antiderivative, which is an integral from some number, and I pick 0, to x, my variable, of my derivative. And so as I move along, I'm going to be able to compute uh, the actual heights. Now there's one more piece. There's also an integration constant. So here I have an antiderivative. This is an antiderivative, and plus c makes it a general form of my antiderivative. So for example, if I want to calculate f of 0, f of 0 would be the integral from 0 to 0 of the w function above plus constant. Now if I start at 0 and end at 0 of my integral, I don't actually have any area. And so all I'm left with is c. Similarly, if I was interested in f of 1, I would integrate from 0 to 1 of my w function and I would add a constant, oop, dt, almost forgot that, plus my constant. And now as I go and look at the area, I can actually calculate it using the idea of geometry. The area is just a little half of a square. And so the definite integral is actually one half, oh, but it's below the axis, so it's minus one half plus c. Now, we're actually told up above that this function value should equal zero. And this is how we actually figure out the integration constant. Aha! Isn't that cool? C has to equal a half. So here's our new function. Our function f of x is the integral from 0 to x of the w function plus a half. So we can start to calculate some of the values of interest. Okay, so we already know that at 0, f of x is a half. We know that at 1, f of x is equal to 0. At 2, let's see, we want to integrate from 0 to 2, so that would now be a shaded area all the way over to 2, so that has a total area of 1. Oh, but it's negative, and I forgot to add a half, so let's fix that. So negative a half, sorry, one half minus one gives us a value of minus one half. All right, let's hope I can do a little better on the next one. As I go to four, I start at minus a half, and I add another two full units of area. 
So negative a half plus two. Gives me one and a half. If I go to six, I add another two units. So I'm now at three and a half. If I go to seven, oh, I get to subtract a half. So I'm down to three. As I go to eight, I go down another half, because that's another half of a unit. And so I'm now at two and a half. From that point on, I start increasing. So for example, at 9, I've now added a half back, so I'm back to 3. Okay, um, the only other thing I might want to make note of is that if I go backwards, I actually need to subtract. Area. So for example, if I come here to minus 1, notice that the area would be positive, but I'll actually subtract a half. So, for example, at negative 1, I have my other x-intercept at 0. Okay, so now, working left to right, if I start at 1, I go to 0. At 2, I have a height of a negative a half. At 3, notice that the areas cancel. I'm back at 0. 4, I am now at an area of one and a half. At five, I add another one and a half, so I am at height three. Six, I'm now at three and a half. Seven, I lose a half, so I'm back. Eight, I've gained, lost another half, so I'm now at two and a half. At 9, I'm back at 3. And going back to 0, I was at a half and 0. And so we can see that our curve is increasing in concave down, decreasing in concave down, decreasing in concave up, increasing concave up. Keeps going, con point of inflection at 6, turns around, and continues on. And so here's our graph. Uh, we have the actual y values, we have all of our points, and it's kind of cool how the integral allows us to calculate all of those values. And here's the function with all of those points labeled. And that's how you do the second problem.